Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Happy Tuesday, Thanksgiving week. Thanksgiving's in two days. That's right. That's right. Do you have an appetite already? No, no. I was just eating a butterscotch candy. What's your favorite dish on Hallow on Thanksgiving? On well, Halloween? Well, uh, never mind. <laughs> What's your favorite dish on Thanksgiving? Um, like the one thing that you would, you, you like especially that's always served on Thanksgiving. Sweet potatoes with lots of marshmallows that have been put onto the broiler. Yeah, that's like that's like an inch <laughs> an inch of sweet potatoes and three inches of marshmallow. That's about how it that's works, right? Plan. That goes under the broiler. <laughs> <laughs> that's my plan. Yeah, that that's good. And you know, I'm not a stuffing. huge sweet potato eater, but when the ratio of marshmallow mm. to sweet potato is like three or four mm. to one it makes the sweet potatoes quite palatable. Yes, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, that's that's always my my go-to to bring to someone's house on Thanksgiving, which we are going to do this year. Yes, you know, we're taking sweet things. potatoes and uh, pink fluff. Pink fluff. Another family classic. That's right. Pink fluff. So. And also, I was asked to bring chips and onion dip, which hey, I we are that's so pretty easy. good. I, I did that really well. <laughs> Anyway, we have a small group today, but a good group because we realize that people, some people are traveling, some people are out shopping for their Thanksgiving meal and it's whatever. A beautiful, but beautiful day out. Beautiful day. So. But you, you know, everybody always has the opportunity of watching this later. You yes. Know, when it's convenient it's for them. It's on Facebook Live. It's on YouTube. Yes. It's podcasted. So we're creating each one of these for the ages. That's as right. They say, That's right, Patty? right. That is so right. And so I did want to make yeah. a little comment today, um, so that I don't forget to say say this. I told Scott. I don't know if he was just going to say it, but we don't know what's happening uh, lately with Facebook. Um, a number of times, sometimes while we're doing the class, Facebook kind of zones out for a second, and it will say it's waiting to reconnect. I've got like it on my phone, my iPad, and my computer, and I usually only see it on my laptop or my desktop. Um, so what I wanted to tell you guys to do, if something happens, we're stopped for a minute, and all of a sudden you realize we've gone back to the very beginning, just just pull out of Facebook for just a minute and then re-click back in, and you should be right where we are. Hopefully... Uh, people were telling me yesterday that was working for them because we lost a bunch of people and some found their way back, some didn't, some didn't know how to. So all you really need to do is just kind of get off Facebook for just a second and then go right back in and click on Scott's class live. We may have to look for another way to do this besides Facebook. We that might. was just sort of slammed together at the start of the pandemic. So yes, and now it's all. We may have to have a talk with Kyle about that. Yeah, it's an alternative to Facebook. In any event, it's twenty-one um, months. I know it's insane. It's crazy. It's crazy. So, okay. So here's the status of Peril Hall. So new carpet is going to go into Peril Hall next week. The equipment that will enable us to live stream from Peril Hall is here. I anticipate that we can be in Piro, back in Piro for the Tuesday class at noon on Tuesdays shortly. I don't, I can't imagine what the delay would be Probably at this point. Probably before Christmas then? Probably before Christmas, okay. I would think. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. if we do that, I know of that. Of course, I throw that out there and we'll you know, find I'm not out. really, yeah, we better, you know, I'm not the one who has to install the stuff and everything, but I do know all the equipment's here. So that's to, good. To enable us to live yes. stream. So there we go. Yes. So I'll keep you all posted about that. And I guess I'll open us up with prayer. That'd be great. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be gathered on this beautiful Tuesday of Thanksgiving week. And we are thankful for the opportunity to come together like this and to study your word. Just to take time out of this busy week um, to, to, to sit down and and really and really hear your word for us and 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 go through John's gospel and hear the good news as John wanted to tell it and we are grateful for this opportunity and we pray all this in Jesus' name amen amen all righty all righty get over to my side move my little chair out of your way here there we go okay so friends <laughs> Wow. So last week, we got to about chapter 6 through verse 51. Um, and this week, I think what I want to do is just kind of go back to verse 41 
and read our way forward because we're right in the midst of this long section. So let me just, just refresh all of our memories. Um, Jesus had crossed from Capernaum to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and there there had been the miraculous feeding, right? And um, then the disciples got in a boat to come back, and they saw Jesus walking on the water. When they get back to Capernaum, Jesus teaches in the synagogue, and you get this very long block of teaching that continues this theme of the bread, the bread from heaven, the bread of life, the bread that gives life. And we talked about how you'll recall that when in chapter four, when Jesus visits the Samaritan woman at the well, that he talks to her about living water, right? That will, um, that will, um, uh, never has to be, uh, replenished. And she gets all excited because she's thinking in terms of one level. It is the level of water actually in a well that you would actually dip a cup into and drink. And so Jesus is doing much the same thing now with the bread because he has taken the bread and he's focusing it on himself. And as we talked about last week and even the week before, I think, this bread from heaven ties to the manna story in the wilderness. When, when God provided the manna and gave, and, and gave his people something to eat, something that they would have to collect every day so that they were constantly reinforced, um, that they were dependent upon God, not independent of God, which is a root of a lot of what goes wrong with people is to think that we um, are independent of God, that we, that we belong to ourselves, that we own ourselves, whereas in reality, we are gods, and, and it's God who provides us the shape for our lives. So, Jesus is teaching in the, in the synagogue, and there's a, if you have a red letter Bible, which I don't use, but, you know, because I think it overemphasizes his words over his actions, um, there's this large block of Jesus' teachings in chapter 6, in the synagogue in Capernaum. And just because I have it, let's look at the map. There's a white arrow pointing to where Capernaum is. It is a significant place um, in the Gospels, all four of them, because it is where Jesus' headquarters is. And um, probably should have done it today, but I'll bring um, a few photos of Capernaum as 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 it exists today and maybe a couple drawings of how it existed then for for next week just to kind of make it more more concrete right which is what we want to try to do these are all real places real people real times and so jesus is teaching in this synagogue in capernaum when you visit capernaum the synagogue that is there is a later synagogue. It's sort of the, I joke around that it's the result of a capital project um, in Capernaum. But it's built on the foundation of the synagogue that was there in Jesus' day and on the foundation of the synagogue that Jesus is teaching in here in chapter 6. So that's all kind of cool. And sorry I didn't bring the photos, but there we go. Didn't think about it. Should have thought about it. A lot of things I need to think about these days that don't always easily come to mind. So let's just pick up in chapter 6, verse 41, and we will try to hear Jesus well in this. He is taking, he's a, trying to accomplish two things. Bring the, his listeners, the disciples, which is a larger group of those who see themselves as Jesus' followers, including the 12, and take them to a deeper understanding of what Jesus is doing, but more importantly, who Jesus is. Because that's the question. That's really the question. Above all else, that's the question. Who is Jesus? It is like in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, when Paul Newman and Robert Redford are looking out over the horizon as the posse's chasing them, they just keep asking themselves, who are those guys? Who are those guys? Well, 
you know, in the Gospels, the question is, who is Jesus? And the, the answer, the true answer to that is something, of course, that people find shocking and blasphemous and um, most, most can't, can't handle. So anyway, okay, verse 41 of chapter 6 is where we're going to start. Do you have anything, anything to add, Patty, nope. before we get going here? I think we're great. Okay. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Right? They're, they're, which is a way of saying they're grasping to some degree what he's actually saying. And they said, well, pff, this is Jesus. Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Which means I came from God. They grew up with him. They know his parents. They know where he was. Some of them babysat him, changed his diapers, whatever. You know, you run into the same thing in the other Gospels. You run into the same thing when Jesus is in Nazareth. How could this be? We know who he is. The idea being that one from sent from God comes like nobody else has. Right? It's not going to be born to uh, uh, a young woman barely more than a girl from a village in Galilee. No, going to arrive on, I don't know, chariots coming out of the sky or something. So Jesus says to them in verse 43, Stop grumbling amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, persuades them, pulls them in. And I will raise them up at the last day. Right? That's that that, that's tying it to the Jewish promise of the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of the body. And then he goes on, it's written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. It is God who is going to draw people in. It's God who will teach people the truth. The emphasis is on God's work. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. Constant theme from Jesus this is exactly what he said in Nicodemus. If you, if you understood the scriptures, if you really knew God, you would know what I'm telling you. You would understand what I'm telling you. Everyone who has heard the Father really heard. You know, there's a big difference between, you know, uh, li listening to words and really hearing. Everyone who has really heard and understood the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes the, in the truth of this that he is saying, in, in who believes in um in the one who has been sent by the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. You need to trust this, he says. It's so. It's true. Verse 47. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Bread sustains us. Bread is one of the most sustaining foods throughout human history in all its various shapes and forms. Today we eat a lot of bread that's not very wholesome and nutritious. But back in, back in those days, bread was a fundamental part of the diet and would carry a lot of life-giving nutrition. But of course, it's just a loaf. So the, it didn't keep people from dying. It didn't, didn't, it wasn't anything like that. Now Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life. Life-giving in a sense that nutritious wheat bread can't be. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, dot, 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 me, which anyone may eat and not die. And he's going to expand on this in a little bit, Right? Because he, he's taken them down to a down to a deeper level, and it's very, um, I think it's very very shocking in a way. 
and I'll try to help us with it. Here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which any one may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Jesus is life-giving in Jesus' very being. As God is life-giving in Jesus' very... God is life-giving in God's very being. And Jesus is God. You and I know this. We know this from the <coughs> first verse of the first chapter of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Wow. Okay. Became flesh and dwelt among us. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh. In other words, if Jesus is the Word become flesh, then his flesh carries carries the word. It's um, his flesh carries the presence of God. This bread is my flesh, which I will give. Looking ahead to his crucifixion for the life of the world. He's going to give up that earthly body. Let it be slain for the, for the life of the world. So, of course, you know, I mean, people really are pretty literal. And these words, even when we read them 2,000 years after, with 2,000 years of Christianity behind us, they're pretty challenging, I think. We, we tend to want to over-spiritualize John's gospel, and we shouldn't. And that's why he uses, Jesus is using these very concrete words like flesh and eat. The, the eat word that Jesus uses is a word like chew or munch. It is. It is. I saw that. Two or munch or something. It's very concrete. It's very down to earth. It's very every day. Right? So, of course, in verse 52, it's not surprising. Then the Jews, this, again, this would really be, I think, the Jewish leaders, I guess. It's, it does get confusing in John sometimes as to who exactly he's referring to. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Of course, you know, Jesus isn't calling any, anybody to a new cannibalistic existence. In the early years of the early decades of the Christian church, the Christians were accused of that by their pagan neighbors. There was a lot of whispering campaigns and so forth about the Christians and the strange things they did and how they would meet in the evenings, you know, and eat the body and drink the blood of this God that they worship. You can kind of understand where that would come from. Okay? So, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat, unless you chew, unless you munch the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. So... <clears throat> okay, you have to admit, that does sound kind of weird. I mean, we know, we're Christians, and we've known this and have the Bible and Bible studies, and we know the whole metaphor. But for these people just standing there... Particularly because they're all Jews, and in the law of Moses, one of the one of the y'all have heard of kosher cooking, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Kosher meat. What's kosher meat? Kosher meat is meat that has been carefully prepared so that all the blood has been drained out of the slaughtered animal. 
That's the key thing about kosher meat. All the blood has been drained out. And the reason is because in the law of Moses, it says you shall not eat meat with blood in it. You shall not drink blood. Um, and it's because blood is life-carrying. Blood is life-giving. Even if you're an ancient person living 3,000 years ago, you know that it's not good if you start losing the blood out of your body, right? Right. So, like I said, it isn't surprising that the pagans would 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 whisper about the Christians and see them as 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 cannibals and so forth. So, um, let me tell a story about King David. Um, this is something that N.T. Wright pointed me to. There's a lot of stories about David in which David is fighting. He's in campaigns against thus and so. In one of his campaigns against the Philistines, he and his fighters are, you know, they're they're lined up and, and the Philistines are across from them. And David is dying of thirst, just dying dying of thirst and he gives voice to that and he says oh my 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 I sure do wish I had you know some of that sweet water from the well at Bethlehem it's just the best well three of his closest heroes his closest fighters they decide that they're going to make their way through the Philistine line and go get D David this water and they do and they bring the water back. And David says, I'm not going to drink the blood of my friends. And what does he mean? And, and he pours the water out on the ground and won't drink it. Too much was risked. He couldn't have imagined one of his closest friends, one of his, to have given his life so that David could have a drink of water from a well in Bethlehem, right? Right. It, that's 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 a good moment for David. Here, what is Jesus saying? Well, yes. Drink my blood. I am making this sacrifice for you. You need to participate in this. I am. This, this 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 metaphor of of giving up his flat not really a metaphor he's going to give up his body and and his blood but it is a matter of participation in Christ and in what is coming it is it is sacramental because Jesus is the word Jesus is the word and and the word became flesh and Jesus is willingly going to sacrifice himself for, for the world, for these people, for you, and for me. And, 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 and so it, what does he say at the Last Supper? He says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Now, the, the argument that Christians have is how to understand this. So let's talk a, bit, a minute about how it was understood for the first millennium and a half in the church. That, and here's how it worked. You've probably heard of the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. Big word, not that hard to understand. It, it's grounded in the, philo in, the, in the philosophy and teachings of Aristotle, actually. And here's, here's, here's how to understand it. If you go out to a pasture, if you went to Candy Sims's ranch out there in the country, they have horses. And you might look at these horses and you would see tall horses and short horses, big ones, small ones, white ones, brown ones, black horses. 
there'd be different colors, there'd be different sizes, rest, different personalities, but they would all share a certain something we might call hoarseness. Horseness. Horseness. The yeah. essence of horses. The essence of horseness. <laughs> the essence of horses. It would, it's what makes all horses horses. What makes all horses horses? Well, their underlying horseness for Aristotle. Now, so when you look at the horses and Candy's pasture, you what you see are horses that have different sizes and shapes and colors and all the rest of it. Aristotle called this the horse's accidents. A-C-C-I-D-E-N-S. No T, it's not an accident. He called it the accidents of the horse. The underlying horseness shared by all the horses, he called a the substance. The substance. So you could do the same thing with shirts, all the different kind of looking shirts, different sizes, colors, right there, but they all share shirtness. You could do the same thing with, I don't know, most anything, I guess, right? So, the doctrine that developed in the Christian church was that in the Eucharist, in, in, the, in the communion done by the priest, when the priest comes to the point in that liturgy where the priest is blessing the food and and you come to the to the I call it the special moment the bread the substance of the bread and the substance of the wine is changed from breadness and wineness to the body and blood of Christ but the accidents the way it looks and smells and it's colored or the wine is 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 red or white or taste this or that. That's left unchanged. The accidents is left unchanged, but the substance is changed. And and because you are then actually eating the body and blood of Christ. That's why it's called trans, like change, transubstance, transubstantiation. Is that word used anywhere else in anything in the world other than referring to what happens? I no, I, I think it's really uh, this Roman Catholic doctrine of of transubstantiation. The only place I hear it used, you hear it. Um, also, I think the Lutherans subscribe to transubstantiation. Um, Luther would pound the table and say, "This is my body. This is my blood." As the other reformers were heading in a little different direction. They were, divor they were divorcing themselves from this Aristotelian understanding of reality and, and, and transubstantiation. And, and some went as far as the Baptist, which made the whole communion thing just a remembering of what Christ has done. Methodists, of course, we are people of the extreme center. We Methodists are, um, like our Anglican and Episcopal forebears. And so for us, there is mystery. We, we proclaim the presence of Christ um, uh, in the elements of communion, but not to the extent of embracing this transubstantiation that the Catholics hold to. So there you go. So you see, so these kind of verses are what gives rise to all that kind of stuff, right? So... You know, uh, Candy, what does Jesus mean? There's nothing like hugging hoarseness. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's nothing like hugging hoarseness. But Jesus is just step back for a second, and Jesus is uh, accomplishing several things here. He is calling them to fully participate in what is coming. He is telling them that what is coming is sacrificial, right? Um, and I think that John, who doesn't have a last, there's no Last Supper moment where where um, where there, this is my body, this is my blood moment at the Last Supper. It's the foot washing that John has. Uh, I think that John. Um, 
understands the, the, the sacramental nature of what he is writing here, that, that this word made flesh, who is Jesus, is the sign, the symbol, and the actual presence of, of God. And if you want, look at verse 55. For my flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. What he means, if you want to embrace, if you want to embrace the life, the eternal life that Jesus is offering, you must embrace him, his faithfulness, his sacrifice all the way to death, even death on a cross. It's, it's, it is in that sacrifice that he is going to make of himself when his goodness meets the evil powers of this world. It's his sacrifice that is going to enable the reconciliation of us with God, of us with God. Verse 56, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains, abides in me and I in them. These are words again of this participation. There's a lot in the New Testament about our participation in Christ, about our being joined with him, that what is true of him becomes true of us. And I think John writes this in a way that we should have to be careful about over-spiritualizing it. That's why understanding that the word for eat is like chew and munch, and it's real food, it's real bread. Jesus is making it very, very concrete. Why? Because his sacrifice is going to be very concrete. He isn't going to be spiritually nailed to a cross. He's going to be physically nailed to a cross. His bones are going, right? He's, right? So his blood is going to be spilt. He's going to be beaten. So it's real and it's, and it's concrete. As I see Yvonne Hayes has maybe helped me understand. Yeah, maybe. See, there we go. You know, Lutherans are the close among the Protestants, Lutherans are the closest to the Roman Catholic. So they may maybe the maybe the Lutherans have not followed on transubstantiation. I don't know. The whole thing I think is difficult because I mean, who who follows Aristotle really in his teaching about hoarseness and we could go with everything that goes with it about the world of, you know, the existence of the forms and the rest of it. So, in any event... I love what Yvonne put at the end. <laughs> From a Catholic married to a Lutheran, both practicing Methodist. <laughs> there we go, because we get... Uh, yes. We have Catholic Baptist couples, Catholic Lutheran couples. Yvonne, I am a <coughs> former Catholic myself. Yeah. Yep. All right, thank you, Yvonne. So, verse 57... Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. It, it's going to be like later he's going to be talking about a vine, right? And he is the true vine. And you need to abide in, you need to be remain in the vine. This participation language, this abiding language, this remaining language by G of G, that Jesus uses is so so common. He talks this way a lot. Paul talks this way a lot. Um, and it, it takes you from merely an intellectual assent to a group of doctrines or sort of, yeah, I'll sign on with that guy, <laughs> into really, really understanding that We, we, we are one with Christ. We are brothers and sisters with Christ, of Christ. 
It's 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 mysterious. I I will acknowledge that it is. But it's certainly not about distance, is it? Away from. So he says in verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. There you go. The manna was great. It kept you going. Just as, you know, the water at the well for the Samaritan woman keeps her going. But it is the living water. It is the bread from heaven. It is Jesus who is both the living water and the bread from heaven that will sustain us in eternity. And verse 59, he said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And wow, you can just imagine. And people were, and let's say he did it all in one day, but he's teaching in the synagogue there in Capernaum. But you can just imagine, people's heads are swimming. They don't know what to make of it. I'm sure many, many were deeply offended. Jews don't drink or eat blood. The meat is carefully prepared so that they don't. And here he is. What is he talking about? You know, we're, I, feel, I feel like every time I come to a paragraph like this, I'm sort of stumbling my way through it because it's just we're struggling to understand the things of God. What does Jesus mean? What does he really mean here? It's not just metaphorical. The words he uses are not, they're, 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 these are very concrete words. But he's not calling people to be cannibals. Anyway, there you go. This is, this, this is the glory and the challenge of John's gospel. Verse 60 is no surprise. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Who can buy this? Aware? So yes, Patty? This is many of his disciples. This doesn't mean it's part of the 12. It could be. That's a good point, you know, Patty. This is. Other this... people that are just there that day. Yes. And just in general, people who had been, who had, were following Jesus and, you know, thinking to themselves, I'm signing on for this. They're grumbling and they're going, I don't understand. This is a hard teaching. This is a larger group than the 12. You know, one thing that you were saying, yeah. it just in the last paragraph before that, which I don't think I've ever stopped to think about it at all. Always knowing, of course, that, you know, the body and blood of Jesus. But I never really stopped to think about it. Like, as you said, the big thing about being kosher is being this bloodless meat because so like blood to these folks must have been pretty abhorrent to even think about i'm guessing since. it's unclean so the fact that he is like the whole idea of it was had to be you know because it still is mind-blowing to us except that we're used to it the whole thing of jesus's body and blood um but wow this hit them in a different level than i think it would hit us we it do, would. We do with yes. rare steak. People eat raw meat, steak tartare. They eat <laughs> things like that. Yes. So to even talk about drinking the blood of, you know, Jesus. Yes. Oh my gosh. It it it, it just kind of opened my eyes to like a whole different thing as to what they were hearing. How this had to blow their minds. Like they had what to be is deeply talking about. They had to be deeply offended yeah. and, and confused. Yes. And and not really grasp it. Jesus is trying to take them to a to a new place, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you have to participate in this in this new place, right? Yes. Because guess what? His flesh, his body, yeah. will be given for them. Yes, physically. 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 Not mm -hmm. not just a spiritual idea. Physically. Mm -hmm. Yep. I just yep. never, I don't know why, it just never well, really I, I, I think like it just did now, just thinking about how, um, yes, you know, draining all the, the animals, every drop of blood out of them and everything. 
Yep. Okay. Okay. So verse 60, on hearing this, many of his disciples said, well, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? You know, I, after our last, just talking about this, I, I think we get that. So verse 61, aware that his disciples, this is more than the 12, were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? <laughs> the answer would be yes. Verse 62, then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? This John doesn't have an ascension moment in his gospel. There's a reference to it later on. But here Jesus is saying to them, well, if you think you're offended by this, you just wait until you see me ascending to heaven. If you see me ascending to God. Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man, who is Jesus? We've been through this. That is, that is the most common way he refers to himself. Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Because he said, I am the bread from heaven. Right? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? We could go back. We won't, but we could go back and look at the end of the first chapter. Remember where the Son of Man is the one on whom the angels are um, ascending and descending in, in Jacob's ladder. Here it's the ascension. Verse 63, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The spirit, God's spirit, gives life. You're not going to find eternal life in the things of this world. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. They're full of life. They're life-giving words. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The words I have... God, when, when God creates everything in Genesis chapter 1, how does God actually do it? Does it, God get out hammer and nails? Paintbrush? No. God speaks creation into existence. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Right? God speaks creation into existence. The Word, God's Word, the words of Jesus are, are, are life-giving. That's why we modern Westerners have to be careful because we think it's all about simply understanding, you know, coming to know Jesus' words and stuff. No, it's taking them in. They're life-giving. They're life-giving in themselves. The word of Jesus has life-giving power. They're more than symbols on a page. The words have life-giving power. They are life. They are full of the, the Spirit. And I think the NIV is right to capitalize Spirit as in the Holy Spirit here. They are full of the Spirit in life. Yet there are some of you who don't believe, Jesus goes on. There are some of you who don't believe. And then John explains for us, For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe, which of them did not trust him, would not trust him, and who would betray him. And he went on to say, quote, This is why I tell you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. So let's talk about this. In For, for John Calvin, this enabling that we're speaking of right here. This enabling is God choosing to draw certain people and simply not drawing others, period. 
And so from the beginning, there were those who would be saved and though there, there are those who would not. And John Calvin being John Calvin, you can build up a scriptural case for that. John Wesley said, no, that, that is, that's not it, Mr. Calvin. <laughs> you, are, you are coming at this wrongly. And Wesley spoke of this enabling as the result of prevenient grace. It, um, it is a grace poured out on everyone. that enables people to seek after God. Doesn't make them do it, but enables them to do it. And doesn't suppress their ability to resist God. If so, God is in the end going to drag anybody in kicking and screaming. And so when you just talk about this a little bit with Calvin and Wesley, these, you know, these are Christian, well, I'm going to call it Christian intramural arguments, debates about how we should understand this. And, you know, Wesley wrote that he and Calvin were a hair breadth apart. But you see, it's kind of a big, it's kind of a large hair in a way because... This, all the emphasis is on what God does. But Wesley had, Wesley understood, I think rightly, that freedom of choice has to remain. Because what does God want? The ultimate goal is for us to love him. And, and for love to be love, it has to be freely given. So that is the fountain of countless arguments among Christians. Some of you may have been part of Monday night, my Monday night class, and you might remember our resident Calvinist, John Lang, who always wanted to talk about these things. Um, uh, and uh, John passed away. Last week, he had he came down with cancer. Um, he passed away. Like he they had he and Linda had moved away to be closer to their kids, which was which was good. I don't think he was sick when he did that, but he didn't confide in me if he was. But but John passed away. But I will always remember John as you know one of those. He was a he oh he would laugh about it. He was a jovial Calvinist. Um, <laughs> we hope he had all those things written down on yeah. the index cards. So I, so I picture him sitting down right now, cards. monopolizing <laughs> Paul's and Jesus' time and everything to say, okay, I want to talk about this. So there we go. So Jesus says, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. True, true, true. When t t t Think of the parable of the lost sheep. Does the sheep find Jesus or does Jesus, or in the parable... Does the she does the sheep find does the lost sheep find the shepherd or does the shepherd find the lost sheep? The shepherd finds the lost sheep. It's about God's initiative, God's God seeking after us. We are so inclined to make it about us. We are so inclined to make it about what we do. And and I think too way too much of the time we fail to we get we we get we get it wrong and we make it about less about what God is doing and more about what we're doing and that is never what i mean to say never it is about what god is doing well any thoughts or questions about all that patty no over there anybody went in nope nope we're kind of quiet right now Duck is telling us. I that's right. They were watching. Um, uh, they were watching our class on for Sunday morning, ship. sipping on mimosas. Well, uh, we <laughs> joked about that, so he's letting us know they did not actually drink them during church. <laughs> <laughs> it would be okay. It would really be okay. It it not would. the kind of thing I get uptight about, certainly. Well, from this time, 
Here's, here's the great summary verse of this whole thing. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Right? They just, they just couldn't understand. They couldn't get there. It's like, it is like Nicodemus in chapter 3, who just kind of left shaking his head. He would come back, right? But he was confused. He didn't understand. They don't understand. I, I really don't blame them for not understanding. It doesn't mean they don't come back to Jesus. But from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They just couldn't handle it. <laughs> like in that movie with Jack Nicholson, they couldn't handle the truth. Um, yes. The, it's so, it's one of the big challenges on Christian churches today and Christian preachers today is to try to preach the truth as best we can to stay true to the gospel, to stay, stay true to scripture as best we can, knowing we our understandings are limited and have failings and all the rest of it. I get all those qualifiers. But to try to, to, to preach the truth of the gospel and the truth revealed in scripture and not preach what people want to hear. Right? Which are often and usually not the same thing. You, you can hear, you know, in the business world, you can, you know, if you're selling soap, you can talk about people's perceived need for what they want out of soap. Well, in church, we can't really talk about people's perceived need. We have to talk about what they really need, not what they think they need, what they, what, what they really need. And that's why pastors are shepherds. Um, and uh, John Ortberg, great teaching pastor in California, has written about this a lot. And he just says, man, is it tempting to want to roll out the three-ring circus every Sunday morning. He says, I know how to fill pews, but that isn't, what, that isn't, my, that isn't my job. My job is to fill pews. My job is to preach the good news. So here it is. Jesus was telling them who he is. He's been telling them what lies ahead. And they can't handle it. From this time, verse 66, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And so Jesus asked the 12 now, capital T, 12, but now we're getting the 12, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God, which is a title that has a lot of meaning. It could be used to refer to a person a few times or to God even, because of course God, God is the Holy One. But this verse doesn't pack quite as much punch as it does in the Synoptic Gospels because it's a huge moment when Peter says to Jesus, you are the Messiah. In this Gospel, we've known that Ming Andrew says, pronounces him Messiah in the first chapter. So there's kind of a lot more of this kind of thing. But of course, Peter is right. Lord, to whom shall we go? Where else would you go for the truth? You have the words of eternal life. Who else has the words of eternal life? Right? That eternal life is, is found in God. It's God who is the giver of life. There's no doctors. There's nobody who can offer such a thing on this planet. You know, they can keep you going for a few more years, keep you going longer now than they used to be able to keep you going, but it all comes quickly. You have the words of eternal life. We, speaking for the 12, we have come to believe, to have faith, that's that pistis word, to have faith and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you? The twelve, yet one of you is a devil. And John then puts in quotes, he meant Judas. I'm in parentheses. 
Um, he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. So Jesus, Jesus sees the truth. And I guess we could have a long discussion about why Jesus called Judas. We could have a long discussion about is it preordained that Judas will betray Jesus and over something, something that he has no control over? I would resist that idea strongly. But Jesus knows Judas' heart. Maybe he called Judas in hopes that Judas would change, like the Grinch changed. So, anyway, okay, so, anything over there, Patty? No, honey. Okay, so we're going to go into chapter 7 for a bit here. So, we're going to come to the Festival of Tabernacles. We're gonna, I'll talk about it when we get there. Okay. So after this, Jesus went around in Galilee. Let me put the map up again. There we go. He is staying up there in Galilee in the north. Right? Um, Galilee, so he's working in... You can't actually see me move my little mouse around, can you? No, of course not. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> in the north, working in the hills and Nazareth is to the west and visiting these places. That's... You know, that's where he's going and he's teaching probably a lot of time around the Sea of Galilee on the western uh, shore because it was easier to walk around the shore than it was to try to get through these hills. Um, so after this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea to the south around Jerusalem down there because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. Galilee is far enough from, from Jerusalem that it was a place where a lot of like rebel, little small rebel groups and other things would form because they weren't under the immediate eye of the Jewish leaders, of the priests and, and the temple guards and the rest of it. So Jesus is staying in Galilee. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. So let's talk. They want him to go, and he should. Let me explain. There are three big festivals in Judaism. There is Passover in the spring. It is during Passover in a few years, a couple of years from here that Jesus is crucified. There is, um, so Passover is in the spring, there is Pentecost, which is in the early summer, and there is tabernacles, or booths, it's called, which happens in the fall. And what we're talking about is that third festival. A Jewish man was expected to come to Jerusalem for all three every year. The, tab the Festival of Tabernacles, or Booths, was a festival built around remembering that they were once nomads. That they were once an alien people themselves. That they were wanderers. And even today, during the Festival of Tabernacles, many Jewish families who live in Israel will, and are devout, and I think many who are not devout, but just follow the festivals, follow this festival, at least the way lots and lots of non-Christians, secular people put up Christmas trees, they go out and in their backyard they put up a tent. And the family lives in this tent for like the whole festival, right? Because that's what it is. It's a festival of tents, tabernacles, booths. That's the idea. Remembering this time long past well, not that long, when they were nomads. Because, of course, even though in the day of Jesus they had been back in the land for hundreds of years, 
It's not long after Jesus before the Jews are basically gone from the land and don't begin to return to the land until the 19th century and early 20th century. So this wandering, this homelessness, as it were, is, is what Tabernacles is all about as a Jewish festival. And Jesus' brothers, these for us Protestants, these are his half-brothers. Um, younger brothers born to Mary and Joseph, the Roman Catholics who believe that Mary remained a virgin for her whole life, understand these to be Jesus' stepbrothers that Joseph brings into his marriage to Mary, Joseph being much older. I'm going to ask him someday. Joseph, uh, Joseph that is. So anyway, so Jesus' brothers say to Jesus, leave Galilee, go to Judea, let people see what you're doing. Verse 4, no one wants to become a public figure. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. <laughs> but look at verse 5, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. They didn't put their faith in Jesus. They're treating him just like as if he were any 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 regular Joe out there wanting to get himself up on Instagram. Isn't that what that's about, Patty? I think so. In our world today, it would be, hey, you got to be on Instagram. you got to be on TikTok, man. you got to get out there. you got to put yourself out there. got to go viral. got to go viral, man. Nobody who wants to become a public figure can stay off that stuff. You can't just sit in your home and do that. Well, I guess you could. <laughs> Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. They didn't... Ah. You know, you wonder if there's even some hint of, of sending him to the danger. Are they envious of Jesus? Are they jealous of Jesus? Um, and so they figure, ah, go on down there, do your thing, and we'll see what happens. So Jesus says to them in verse 6, My time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. You're a, right... Let me not get too ahead of myself. The world can't hate you. Now, why can't the world hate the brothers? Because they're of the world. Yes. But it hates me. Why does the world hate Jesus? Because he's not of the world. Because I testify that the world's works are evil. You go to the festival. <laughs> I'm not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. And after he had said this, he stayed in Galilee. You do in the Gospels, not just this one, but even the others, Jesus, how can I put this, managing his public ministry in such a way that it doesn't come to a premature end. So, for example when he is performing miracles among the on the western side of Galilee in particular, he tells people after he has healed them, this is principally in the synoptics, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. When he goes to the Gentile land on the east side and does something, he said, go tell the world <laughs> what's happening because Jesus doesn't face any danger from the Gentiles on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. They don't care about this. This is a Jewish thing. So he's going to stay in Galilee. Verse 10, however, after his brothers had left for the festival, he, uh, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. In secret. This kind of thing happens in John's Gospel. Jesus, he almost just appears out of nowhere sometimes. He disappears into nowhere sometimes. So the brothers leave, and Jesus goes. He's just not going to do it publicly, but in secret. Verse 11, now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, well, where is he? See, because they have already decided they need to get rid of him. Now among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about Jesus. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, 
No, he deceives the people. Have you heard him? <laughs> right, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the le leaders. So the picture you get is that the brothers are are doing the proper thing, as Jewish men were expected to. They go to the festival in public. Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem in secret. There's a lot of murmuring in Jerusalem about this Jesus guy. Um, in John's Gospel, John has John conveys a lot more about what happens with Jesus in Jerusalem. There isn't much in the in in the synoptics about Jesus in Jerusalem. Most of it is set up is set in Galilee, but in in John's Gospel, yeah, you get a lot of Jerusalem time, and so you can picture the murmuring and so forth that um, that is going on. In the city, during this crowded festival, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, the city was crowded. They were because of their expectation that all the Jewish men who could would be there. And many of them would bring, bring families. It was These were the three big festivals in the Jewish year. Well, verse 14, not until halfway through the festival, did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach? And the Jews there were amazed. And they asked themselves, how did this man get such teaching without having been taught? I mean, it's sort of like a play on what Nathaniel said in the first chapter. I mean, he's from Nazareth. That's Hicksville. <laughs> That's Hicksville up there. You know, where did he, you know, he's not one of these, he does, has a come down and stuttered, studied under a Gamaliel like uh, uh, Paul. Paul, right, Patty? Paul came down from Tarsus and studied under Gamaliel, this, this one of the leading rabbis of the day. Not this Jesus guy. Where did he learn this? And then Jesus says, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? And the crowd answers him, You are demon-possessed. Who's trying to kill you? Well, Jesus knows that the leaders are whispering among themselves, and they are determining, yeah, he's going to have to go. You're demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who's trying to kill you? So, we're, I'm about to end it. We'll just look, look at verse 21. Jesus said to them, I did one miracle, and you are all amazed. And what, is, what do you think that miracle, what is that one miracle? You've got to think back in the gospel. This, there's the, he's, he's gone to Jerusalem, and he does a miracle. And it's in John's gospel. And that's the miracle he is doubtlessly referring to. I did one miracle, and you are all just amazed, agog. Remember when he went to the pools of Bethesda yes. with the guy who had been crippled for 38 years? So right away, when Jesus refers to that miracle, there are two issues on the table. One is the miracle doing itself, right? But as you recall, he did it on the Sabbath and told the man to pick up his mat and walk away on the Sabbath. And so... To, uh, so far as the Jewish leaders are concerned, Jesus broke the Sabbath law. So when we come back together next Tuesday, we'll just kind of pick it up here as Jesus is now confronting the Jewish leaders and the crowds in Jerusalem in this slowly building confrontation that we're in, in the midst of. So, 
anything else over there, Patty? Anybody got any final word for us? No. No? no final word today. Okay. No final word. All yeah. right. Well. All good. All good. All good. Beautiful I don't, day. I don't beautiful think week. We, we lost anybody today, nope. which is it's a good thing. The number stayed pretty steady. It's just, it's hard to know what goes wrong with Facebook sometimes. It is. Oh, there I am. There we are. <laughs> There's room for you here. There is. <laughs> There's room for me at the end. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have to put my sweater on. It's really? chilly back in here. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I kind of work up a sweat. I know. This. You're a guy. Yeah. Yeah. Plus yeah. that. Plus that. <laughs> Thank you guys for being with us today. We really hope every one of you has a lovely Thanksgiving. Absolutely. Be safe, please, if you're driving out of town or if, even if you're driving in town. Um, in the last few days that I've been out, things have been a little bit crazy. Of course, people are shopping for Thanksgiving food, but already people, are, I think, are getting concerned about not having Christmas stuff and shipping right. problems. And so... Please have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We plan on doing so, um, eating with one of our sons and a whole bunch of, uh, of their friends. And uh, our poor Robbie is still at home with Savannah as he has COVID after his two vaccines. So, so uh, Savannah did not get it and they're gonna have a nice quiet little Thanksgiving amongst yes. themselves. So please join me in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that we get together every Tuesday. And uh, Lord, although this has been really wonderful, we really are looking forward to the time we're going to get to see each other in person, hopefully soon, and bring um, just a different kind of vibe, I think, to the whole group. Uh, of course, we'll still be meeting online at the same time, of course. Um, we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would lift up all of the joys and the concerns, God, that we have on our heart right now to you, Lord. We pray, God, that this is a peaceful week in our country and in the world. And we do continue, Lord, to pray for all of those who were affected by the tragedy this um, weekend in Wisconsin. We just pray for it, Lord. We pray for peace in our nation. We pray for the kind of peace, God, that only you can give. Lord, we lift up all these prayers to you. We are very, very grateful, Lord, and most of all grateful for the gift of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye, friends. Adios, everybody. Happy See Thanksgiving. You Sunday. See you Sunday if you're yes, in town. Sunday. If not, tell me where you are when you check in online. Yeah. Yes. So we, I could be jealous. We, I could have Facebook we envy. May, <laughs> we may start asking, like, who's the furthest away or something, yeah, right? Who yeah, knows? Yeah, Who knows? Doug knows. Last week, uh, we were so happy for you guys. You know that. But Scott always calls it, Patty, you've got Facebook envy. So I have Facebook <laughs> envy of being on that cruise ship. Yeah. Bye-bye, everybody. everybody. Adios. Bye-bye.